So thanks, thanks very much, and it's a very great uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, not only because it's great to get out of the office, but it's great to come here and to visit with you. And I visited with many of you already uh, today, this afternoon and this evening, over uh, conversations and a uh, very, very lovely dinner. And I'm just grateful to be a guest here at this uh, lovely place. And I must say that um, uh, having been a college trustee myself, uh, that I'm very impressed with uh, everything I've seen here at, at Waynesburg and of the ethic and the ethos uh, of all of your students and your very gifted uh, faculty members. It's a great privilege to be among you and I'm really glad and uh, as I say, feel privileged to be here. So I'm gonna talk for a few minutes. Um, I'm, a, I'm a columnist, uh, I'm not a speaker. So uh, I typed this up and uh, maybe this is an hour and a half and maybe it's 12 minutes, I don't know. And um, so I'll talk about the, uh, with what, some prepared remarks and then uh, to fill out the hour, and not really to fill out, but to enhance the hour, uh, I'll take questions from all of you. Although um, the way these lights are, are uh, configured, I may not see you, so uh, you'll have to stand up and ask a question. But let me just talk for a few minutes about the uh, subject at hand. Um, it's a really fascinating period in our time, in our country's history, because we have a president who broke every rule of presidential campaigning to win the White House. And now, as president, he's breaking nearly every rule of the presidency, departing from customs that date back to even an outsider president like Andrew Jackson, who was president from 1829 to 1837, and an innovative chief executive such as Franklin Roosevelt, who was president from 1933 to 1945. So supporters of the president and detractors alike agree that Mr. Trump is a different kind of president. And they wonder whether his departures from form are precursors to a new style of the presidency or merely an aberration. Now, presidents have been described harshly before. Andrew Johnson, who was impeached in 1868 but not removed from office, was vulnerable of, uh, for many uh, criticisms. And Richard Nixon, who resigned in disgrace in 1974, was guilty himself of many transgressions. Though as a former House member, Senate member, Vice President and President, he had an enormous amount of experience and probably should have done better. But still, Mr. Trump stands out and apart from all of his predecessors. So let's say, talk about the nature of the presidency for a second. The nature of the presidency, to be sure, is shaped by the cumulative actions of all the occupants of the office. And, have, and given that there have only been 44 of them, each new chief executive gets the chance to shape the presidency himself. But almost always they try to fit into an established pattern rather than to depart from that pattern. Presidents try to live up to the dignity of the office, of course. And so they try in a very controlled and defensive, deliberative manner to stand out, but also to stand among their predecessors. The greatest exponent of that notion was former President Ronald Reagan, who though was a gifted speaker, was accustomed as a one-time Hollywood actor to following a script, and he knew the script was the presidency. But even so, presidential behavior and the content of presidencies inevitably are tied to the times in which they're presidents and to the communications technology of each era. Now, Franklin Roosevelt, who's the standard against which all presidents are measured, was the master of radio. John Kennedy mastered television. And Mr. Trump, as you know, is the acknowledged master of the political use of Twitter. So I, I called up in preparation for this a fellow named Richard Norton Smith, who's a friend of mine. And he served as the director of the Hoover, Eisenhower, Ford, and Reagan presidential libraries. He wrote a biography of Herbert Hoover, and he's at work at a Jerry Ford biography. This is what he had to say. The presidency is one office under Franklin Pierce, who was president in the 1850s and another quite different one under Franklin Roosevelt, who was president in the 1930s and early 40s. The presidency reflects the strengths and weaknesses, skills and shortcomings of the occupant of the presidency. Presidents are shaped not only within constitutional bounds, but also within the age in which the president serves. I think that's very wise counsel. But other presidents have served in periods of disruption, not only President Trump. 
periods of disruption, periods of cultural upheaval, and technological change. Some of them, like Franklin Roosevelt, for his down-home rhetoric, despite his aristocratic background, Barack Obama for offering a new vision of who can occupy the office despite his elite education. Both of them gave new shape to the presidency. But I think we can all agree that the Trump years have been exhausting to Washington and to the country. Whatever their virtues, whatever their faults, these 15 months have left the nation not merely tired, but fatigued in the extreme. Now this observation doesn't only address the velocity of politics, but also the Trump style of politics. He's no respecter of rules. He troubles many Republicans because of Republicans' native affinity for order. And he alienates Democrats who wrote many of the rules for the presidency when they occupied it for so many years between 1933 and 1969. So the, the conventional wisdom this very month uh, with, with just finished a uh, much-watched congressional election right here, and a shake-up in the diplomatic profile of the country with the firing of the Secretary of State, and internal White House debates about how and against whom to impose steel and aluminum tar tariffs, all these things answered several vital questions. But they raised even bigger questions. There'd be, in fact, I think there are more open questions about the course of American politics and the character of the Trump era today than there were even a month ago. Now these questions address the very nature of his administration and the prospects for the midterm term congressional elections in November and the outlook for the nuclear crisis on the Korean Peninsula. So let's just look at two of these questions before we move to a more general examination of the president and the press, which is the question I've been asked repeatedly here. So here's the first thing. Did the Democratic triumph in the special congressional election in right here, in Greene County, tell us anything about the political prospects for the midterm congressional elections or about the sustainability of the Trump phenomenon? I would say it has not. Lost in all that media mayhem of the contest between Connor Lamb, who won, and State Representative Rick, Rick Saccone, who did not win, was the notion that the significance of special elections is almost always exaggerated. By their nature, these races, and there have been 86 of them since the beginning of the 21st century, 86. They're idiosyncratic, they're conducted in regions with peculiar economic and cultural circumstances, and contested by local candidates with assets and defects that have little resemblance to presidential politics. So all we know from these uh, elections here in Greene County and the Pittsburgh suburbs is that an appealing young Marine defeated a, a rival who lacked his opponent's political skills. And one more thing. We learned that President Trump is a better campaigner for himself than he is for others. Now here's another question. Is the president's embrace of tariffs on steel and aluminum the harbinger of a fundamental change in the profile of the Republicans and the Democrats, or is it merely the redemption of a campaign pledge he actually made here in Greene County? This is one of the big questions of the age. For while protectionism was one, only one of the issues that Trump wrote into the White House. It's an important element of the American partisan divide. Because as many of you know, in recent years, it's been the Republicans who were the free traders and the Democrats who leaned toward protectionism. Now, many, many years ago in 1988, Richard Gephardt won the 1988 Democratic caucuses in Iowa because he aired, during Christmas, television advertisements that raised concerns about imported Japanese automobiles. And that basically won him the Iowa caucuses. So the Democrats remain skeptical of NAFTA, citing job losses in manufacturing and elsewhere, even though the trade agreement, which was backed by 27 Democrats, was signed by a Democratic president, Bill Clinton. The lead NAFTA opponent in America today is Mr. Trump himself. He calls it the worst trade deal in the history of the world. And though Democrats generally deplore much of the Trump portfolio, we see that union leaders support the president's trade policies and business groups, such as the Chamber of Commerce, which traditionally sides with Republicans, oppose the president's trade initiatives. The result is that we have a political calculus on trade that's completely in motion, that doesn't make any sense historically. It's in transition like so much else. And so too was the relationship between the press and the White House. So let me give you a couple of things that are affecting that relationship between the press and the White House. 
the pressures of a 24-hour news cycle, the financial forces bearing down on legacy media outlets like the Post-Gazette, also the New York Times, CBS, everybody else, the proliferation of alternative news sources who compete with us in the mainstream media, the rapid changes in how, when, and where people consume news, the increased polarization of American civic life, the changes in the attention span of the public, the new uncertainties created by the ascendancy of the millennial generation, many of you, the broadening divisions in American life on an economic basis, rich and poor, the growing divisions in American life between urban and rural, you understand this better than anybody, the chasm between those with college degrees and those without degrees, the shrinking of the middle class, the assault on expertise, the distrust of institutions, the erosion of the position once held by social, cultural, and economic elites, the credibility crisis faced by the media, the vastly different perspectives on the value or the threat of globalization, the promise and the peril of the new technology mobilized by interest groups, politicians, and aggrieved members of the public. And then to all of that, I would add three words, Donald John Trump. It's possible that all of the above elements, the unremarkable aspects of the last third of, of, of this decade uh, of tumult, but considered together a, a cascade of crises, that all of these created the conditions for Mr. Trump's election to the White House. It's possible also to argue that Mr. Trump mobilized or exploited these elements to become the president. And it's possible also to argue that those elements are, depending on your point of view, factors that assure that Mr. Trump is creating a welcome new political and ethical world that's sweeping out a weary, corrupt political architecture that's failed the basic tests of democratic rule, or, by contrast, that he's a dangerous new threat to our political system and the basic values of our culture and its 18th century Enlightenment origins. In the center of this struggle, a nation, a political culture, and an economy wandering between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born, as Matthew Arnold, who died in, 19, in 1888, might have said. In the center of this struggle is us in the nation's press. And as a result of this squeeze between the world that might be dead and the alternative world that might be being born, unavoidable and nearly unprecedented vital questions are being posed questions that were long considered settled, questions like these. What is the truth? Is there such a thing as alternative facts? Or do, do, do people, different groups of people and different interests have their own set of facts that they can use, that they can mobilize to construct their own truths? Who decides what's news? Is one person's news another person's propaganda? Is the financial uh, condition of a media outfit outlet a reflection of its social value? Is there a media conspiracy? Is there an alternative media conspiracy? How can men and women see the same world and yet react to it and report on it so differently? Is the proper model of the press the colonial version where the committees of correspondence were the first bloggers? Or is it the 19th century version where abolitionists and slave owners had their own presses and their own newspapers? Or is it the turn of the last century version where the press created a war in Cuba and promoted social change in the railroad and meatpacking industries? Or is it the mid to late 20th century model where a college-educated cadre of reporters and educators produced news with known transparent standards and reporting norms? Or is it a range war between a liberal elite with contempt for conservative values and a right-wing vanguard determined to blunt the influence of established media and to create its own ascendancy? All those questions, and the answer to all of them is yes. And therein lies the problem, at least for the press, weary and in some cases wasted by the storm, without our customary swagger, which may be a good thing, but also without our psychological confidence, which may not be such a good thing. The press might have faced with grace and self-assurance the questions that the Trump movement posed when newspaper advertising was healthy and when television revenues were fat. But the crisis didn't come at that hour. It came when the press was least equipped to ask the important questions and even less equipped to answer them with self-procession and precision. So putting aside 
the question of who started, whether the press ganged up on Trump or sought to portray him as disqualified, or whether the mere portrayal of the truth worked to the disadvantage of Trump, or even whether Trump stoked antagonisms against the press by portraying it as a biased political force out to destroy him. Putting aside all that, it is incontrovertible that the president and the press are at loggerheads today. Now, the blithe among us, or the history-minded, may argue that it was always thus. Newspapers and newsmen have been troublemakers in American history from the first creaking of a press in New England nearly three centuries ago. Robert Rutledge, who was the editor of the James Madison Papers, once wrote, he's right. Jefferson may have said that he may would have preferred a newspaper over a government, but he also said that advertisements contain the only truth that you can rely on in the newspaper. Today, of course, the advertisements are few and far between. Advertising revenue in 2015 reco recorded its greatest decline since 2009. John Kennedy distrusted the press in Vietnam and attempted to force the New York Times to recall its Saigon correspondent, David Halberstam. Lyndon Johnson was constantly at war with the press, in part because of his own credibility. Richard Nixon's disdain for the press spanned decades. And just after he chose members of his cabinet, shortly after the 68 election, he told them this. Always remember, the men and women of the news media approach this as an adversary relationship. Now, veteran news reporters and executives generally agree that relations between the press and the White House declined with the inauguration of every president between Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. And yet the antagonism between Mr. Trump and the press is at new levels. He's declared the press the enemy of the people, an evocative, sinister phrase first popularized by Soviet communists two-thirds of a century ago. In the first years of the Trump presidency, the New York Times and the Washington Post produced a daily parade of stories injurious to the Trump administration, which in turn responded with a daily assault upon the press, sometimes by the president himself. Now, Mr. Trump and his aides regarded those reports as malicious expressions of bias. The press regarded them as portrayals of the truth, about the inside workings of the administration, about the contradictions between what the president and his aides say and what is demonstrably true. And they portrayed it as part of its historic remit. But this situation, with the press under siege and on the attack, and with a president under siege and under attack, this situation has produced agonizing discussions within newsrooms where we all struggle to define our roles and to square our activities with our traditional responsibilities. Now, the, pres the presence of a president who shades or distorts the truth is nothing new. Franklin Roosevelt sometimes was an accomplished fibber. Dwight Eisenhower camouflaged his intents in a fog of incomprehensible rhetoric. Richard Nixon saw no inherent evil in distracting or misleading the press. Bill Clinton said he didn't have sex with an intern with whom he clearly engaged in sex. But Trump opened his White House years by insisting that he drew Inauguration Day crowds that he plainly did not. And then he spun a series of mistruths that actually prompted a broad discussion about whether news outlets should imply the word lie in writing about the President of the United States. The result was a curious thing, an animated discussion about whether a lie had to be an intentional misstatement. So let's now approach the critical question of our time. If, in fact, Mr. Trump possesses a special, unprecedented, and existential threat to American democracy, and in raising this question, I am not arguing that that's the case, but if he, if he poses that threat, do reporters, editors, and producers have a special unprecedented responsibility to oppose him or to devote special unprecedented resources to examine his activities, his past, his statements, his intentions. Some journalists, and surely some liberals and even some conservative opponents of Trump, many of whom have adopted the phrase the resistance to describe their preoccupation with opposing the president, some journalists feel that's appropriate. Others, some journalists and many Trump supporters inside the White House, on Fox News across the country, feel that the press, especially leg legacy newspapers and the cable, cable networks, CNN and MSBC, are on a crusade that is at base unfair and vengeful, and that's discrediting the media more than the president is. As recently as the beginning of this decade, it was a commonplace to say that journalists, aside from opinion writers, 
have taken a long, lifelong metaphorical oath to operate in the phrase that Adolph Oak supplied in 1896 to the New York Times, which was to give the news impartially, without fear or favor, regardless of party, sect, or interest involved. Now, performing that function was regarded as noble and ennobling work, and for most journalists, that role was enough. Implicit in this was the abiding but largely unspoken faith among journalists that the voting public, if properly informed, almost always makes the right choice. And the occasional anomalies, like James Buchanan of our own state of Pennsylvania, still operated within boundaries that the public found acceptable until it got around to electing more appropriate figures, with James Buchanan leading to Abraham Lincoln. In that conception, journalism's role was to inform, to redeem the responsibilities and privileges of the First Amendment by producing, providing the public with the information it needed to make sober, reasonable, even enlightened selections. At the heart of that conception was the indispensability of that information for voter choice, and thus the indispensability of the journalist as a provider of that information. Politicians governed, judges decided, journalists informed. It was an iron triangle of noble roles and noble responsibilities. It satisfied journalists for generations. But occasionally that wasn't enough. In the World War I years, government created a propaganda bureaucracy that endangered the, that journalistic role in a conflict that, in retrospect, had less consequence for the United States than did the World War that followed. In the 1941 to 45 World War, journalists surveyed the world scene, saw Hitler as an in, irredeemable danger, and showed little sympathy for Nazi Germany. In the Cold War, an unsettling number of journalists, genuine in their contempt for communism, abandoned their role to work for the CIA. An important watershed was the Vietnam War, when journalists went from being critics of the American conduct of the war to being critics of American involvement itself in the war. Now, David Halberstam, whom I mentioned earlier, his work was significant not because he objected to the US being in Vietnam, but because he believed the United States was bungling the conduct of the war. But as anti-war sentiment grew, two important developments unfolded. The first was the ever more aggressive coverage of the war, sometimes deliberately using the horror of war to under support to undermine support for the war. The second was the migration of journalists from their role as chroniclers of events to participants in events, with some high-profile journalists actually joining the anti-war presidential campaigns of Senator Eugene McCarthy and Robert Kennedy. Now, the question beckons journalists again. Cover Donald Trump or use their coverage to undermine Donald Trump? Many journalists believe the former constitutes an act of service in the latter and that, it, that may well be the case. Others believe that Trump is so dramatic a departure from the presidential norm, so severe a threat to the body politic, that they have a special obligation to oppose him in print, on the air, and on the web. This debate waged widely across the country in President Trump's first year. One group takes this position. Trump is a special case and a special danger to the republic. Perhaps he is. But how would members of this group have reacted if a separate group of reporters had argued four or eight years ago that Barack Obama constituted just such, such a threat and required just such a counter-offensive? The very people who make this case for journalism activism against Trump would have recoiled if a separate group had made a similar case against Obama. So in the end, we are left as we have been throughout this evening with questions. How do journalists decide whether a certain political figure, maybe William Jennings Bryan, maybe Franklin Roosevelt, maybe Huey Long, maybe Henry Wallace, is so grave a threat that extraordinary measures are required? Who makes that decision? And can that decision be made by a group of men and women who believe in the wisdom of the people in most cases, but not in this one? These are hard, agonizing, enduring questions. But the answer might not be that hard after all. Perhaps in all eras, journalists should, avoid, should marshal their facts and write their stories oblivious to the criticism they get, whether from right or left. It was a journalist, Walter Lippmann, who in his famous 1922 public opinion uh, book wrote that the function of the truth was to bring to light the hidden facts and set them in relation to one another. Nearly century, a century later, that remains the goal of journalism. 
Perhaps journalists should reaffirm their dedication to the principles of their craft, which is honesty and accuracy above all. As long ago as 1971, the Harvard professor Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in his interregnum between being a Richard Nixon aide and serving as the US ambassador to India, worried that the press grows more and more influential by attitudes generally hostile to American society and American government. But it was also Daniel Patrick Moynihan, then a United States Senator from New York, who popularized the aphorism that everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. A variant of remarks delivered three quarters of a century earlier by Bernard Baruch, who was the financier who advised both Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt. Perhaps journalists should pursue excellence above all for its own sake and for the country's. We quoted a few minutes earlier Richard uh, Rutland, the Madison scholar, and he also wrote this. Before purveying, the purveying of information becomes a lost art, newsmongers, us, must accept the fact that the real test of professionalism is not whether one can protect sources or hang out a shingle, but how well perform, one performs a task vital to society. By telling the American citizenry the whole truth, the newsmongers of the future can vindicate their professionalism. To tell the truth is still the highest calling in politics, in medicine, in law, and above all, in journalism. Now, Rutland wrote that in 1973. It's even more relevant today. Perhaps journalists should take the skepticism they apply to their sources and to the people institutions they cover and apply that skepticism to themselves. Listen to Michael Shudson, the Columbia and University of California SD scholar. Listen to what he wrote. Journalists, like other seekers, must learn to trust themselves and their fellows in the world enough to take everything in, while distrusting themselves and others and the appearances of the world enough not to be taken in by everything. He wrote that in 1978. It's even more relevant now, in 2018. But most of all, professional journalists need to apply the same standards of honesty to the president as they do to themselves and to their peers. In short, the sloppy use of facts cannot be tolerated in a president, just as the sloppy use of facts cannot be tolerated in a journalist. The coverage of President Trump must hold him accountable to the same benchmarks of honesty that journalists apply to their own work. Both of us, the president and the press, will be judged by the public and by history, by that standard, and perhaps by that standard alone. So thank you. And uh, I'll take any questions you have. But you'll have to stand up because I can barely see anybody here. Uh, yes? You mentioned earlier about uh, the divide among American people and, and how we cover it as journalists. Uh, we look at what happened down in Alabama where you have a candidate running who has had, who's uh, accused of having a relationship with somebody who's underage. And then the president comes out and supports that, and then the people in that area still support that candidate. How do you, as a journalist, say, well, this isn't elitism, or this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't some public opinion, this is like, this is wrong in the sense of what is right and wrong? How do we convey that message to the people who, at that time, might view that as equal? Well, that's a good question. Did all of you hear that? He has a nice, loud voice, so I won't repeat his question. I think the first rule here is to remember that the people who are going to decide who's going to be the senator from Alabama are people who live in Alabama and not reporters who live in New York and Washington, number one. Number two, it's the responsibility of reporters, no matter where they live, if they're covering the story, to examine um, the character, uh, which is difficult, of the candidates involved in any way they can or should, uh, and should. Now, that's, that's what caused the clash here. Um, the mainstream media kept pointing out uh, the um, charges against this, the Republican candidate. The Republicans kept pushing back and saying that this was unfair and it was unfounded. Uh, ultimately, the people of Alabama made a choice. Um, if we believe as Americans that the public almost always makes the right choice, and we have to accept that they made the right choice in this case, just as we have to accept they made the right case the right choice in 2016, or if we disagree to take uh, solace and comfort in the fact that Abraham Lincoln succeeded James Buchanan, and that there'll be another chance in three or four years, or in the Senate races, this particular Senate race in two years. 
So the, I, I don't think the press did anything wrong, particularly in the uh, Alabama case. Uh, they uh, examined this in fullest. Um, no election in Alabama, including the elections uh, in 1962 and 64 of um, George Wallace, have ever received this depth of national coverage. I think the public was illuminated by it. Um, and uh, we'll see. I mean, there's the great rule of American politics is the rule that was expressed by Yogi Berra. It ain't over till it's over. And I would add, it's never over. I'm going to be back in my Trumbull bed a lot earlier if you guys don't ask some questions. All right, well, I'll ask myself a question, and then I'll answer it. Are you concerned about the future of the press? And um, was it a coincidence uh, or purely bad luck that the crisis of the press came at the time of a president who was almost uniquely critical of the press? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> it's, it's probably a coincidence, but you know, there, there are no coincidences in life in some ways. The crisis of the press, <coughs> um, and the, uh, by that I mean the financial crisis of the press, did not have its origins in, um, in public trust. Let me just give me a second, please. Um, public trust has been uh, eroding for all institutions, uh, the church, um, the military, uh, Congress, the press. Right now, our approval ratings are about the same as the approval ratings of Congress. And you probably know that it was Mark Twain who said that Congress was America's only native criminal class. Um, so our, our uh, credibility has been eroding at about the same rate as the church, the presidency, Congress, etc. We are facing an existential um, financial crisis right now because our ad re revenues have been declining uh, because advertising is so much more effective in some ways and certainly more, more cheap, cheaper uh, on the web and because circulation is falling at the same time because people have alternative, alternative ways of getting their news. So it's, I would argue that the combination of these two effects is a, is a perfect storm of uh, difficulty for all of us. Thank you for that excellent question. Well, I'll ask another. Oh, there is one, yes. Um, if we're all going to be an online presence and moving in that direction, do you see that as a way to continue to make revenue and, and stay alive, or what do you think that will play? Well, the question is about uh, our multimedia, the Post Gazette's multimedia uh, presence, and is it, uh, what's the strategy? What's the economic strategy? First of all, the, the content strategy is that a lot of this information is so much richer and so much more valuable online than it is in print uh, because of the uh, multimedia uh, potential of the online experience. You can do video, you can do audio, you can do charts, interactivity, etc. And part of it is we have to migrate to where the, where the readers are and where the eyes are. The eyes have migrated online. I would say that of the 35 or 40 people here, uh, and certainly of the, those under 22, that none of you have read the New York Times in the past ever. Um, and that you, your acquaintance with the Post-Gazette um, is casual at best, uh, and, and even less so when Steelers are out of the playoffs. Uh, and so all of your attention is online. It's on your phones. It's uh, to a lesser extent on tablets. So we have to be there. We have to be where the people are. Um, we used to lead opinion. Now we have to follow opinion. And the f opinion we have to follow is people's preferences for how they want to receive information. Now, in an ideal world, is uh, digital better than print? Well, you expect me to say no, but the answer is digital is better than print. Um, you can get so, such, such a richer experience uh, in digital. And I'm old-fashioned. I'm the most old-fashioned person in our news in our newsroom, and I think the future is digital. So you can imagine what everybody else thinks. Go ahead. You're setting a 
a, an, NA, an AFC North record for most questions <laughs> asked in any college appearance that I've been at, and I congratulate you for that. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, covering uh, uh, people who basically help lay lies. For example, I know uh, it's happening locally in like PA. There was a politician who took his life uh, on a, during a press conference because he was caught in lies. Yeah. Why is it so difficult for the press to be able to just say, yeah, this was indeed a lie, instead of calling the person a liar and just saying what they said was a lie? Well, that's a good question. Let me think about that. The word lie is such a blunt instrument that we've been reluctant to use it. Oh, I just used the word fib, I know, or people say uh, misspoke. Now, we've had this yeasty debate, and I mentioned it a little bit a few minutes ago, between well, what, a lie, what is a lie? What if I said at a dinner at my boss's house that the pot roast was excellent, when in fact it was execrable, it was inedible and um, incomprehensibly bad, and I went out for a pizza afterwards. Is that a lie or is that tact? What if I, what if uh, President Nixon said when the guys landed on the moon that it was the greatest day in the history of mankind? Is that a lie or is that an exaggeration? What if um, President Clinton said, I did not have sex with that woman? Is that a lie, or does he define sex as uh, the procreative act or some other kind of physical contact that results in um, sexual pleasure? Um, what if uh, someone says, um, I took a right turn at the corner of Green and Main Streets, when in fact they took a left, and they didn't realize they were wrong. Is that a lie or is that a misconception? So I think we've come down to the notion that a lie, that motive is an important part of the use of the word lie. If your motive is to deceive, then it's a lie. If your motive is, if your motive is pure and you simply made a misstatement, I took a left at the where I took a right, and you didn't realize you were telling an untruth, that's not a lie. So we've been debated in this kind of thing, uh, a debate worthy of Socrates, I suppose, for some time. But I would, I would take um, harbor in that, in that, the, in that a lie has to have a motive of telling an untruth, and that the person has to be conscious of saying something that's not true to be described as a lie. You want to go for a point after touchdown? You got another one? OK, I'll ask one final question. Uh, how will we know what the legacy of President Trump is and what his historical um, his historical uh, record or legacy will be. And I would say that almost none of us here will know for sure. I think we are sure we know, but we won't know for sure. A, a group of historians have already rated him the worst president in history, just as a group of historians might have ranked George W. Bush as the worst president in history, and just as people ranked Dwight Eisenhower as a terrible president and Harry Truman. So the thing, the thing, the last lesson I would leave, learn for you is that the past is always changing. Now that may seem like a ridiculous statement, a lie itself, right? The past is always changing. Well, I think the past is always changing because our view of what happened in the past is fixed, but we're not fixed. Uh, your children, uh, my children, who are a little bit older than you, may find virtue in George W. Bush. 
or in Donald Trump. Um, I grew, I was born in the Eisenhower years and throughout my childhood and young adulthood and adulthood, Dwight Eisenhower was regarded as kind of a moronic president. He was known as the great golfer. He, people said he played, did nothing but play golf. He was incomprehensible in the, um, when he gave speeches. The last four books on Eisenhower have basically changed everyone's view. And, they, and he's regarded as a very great president today. Harry Truman, uh, during his own time, was regarded as kind of a bumpkin. People said, to air is Truman, or I'm just mild about Harry. Well, today we consider probably Truman a top 10 president. His uh, forthrightness, plain speaking, is uh, refreshing in an age of um, deception uh, and, um, and, uh, and lying. He uh, was decisive in his recognition of Israel, uh, in his uh, view of Korea, although people do think he may have made a mistake there. Uh, but basically in his way of approaching the presidency and in his use of the atomic bomb, uh, which, which has itself been a subject of revisionism. So I would say the answer to that question is um, we don't know. There's a very famous story uh, involving Zhou Enlai, who was number two in the Chinese government for about 15 years or maybe even 20 under Mao during the Cold War. And he was uh, quite a scholar, and he actually was um, at the Treaty of Versailles uh, ending World War I. But somebody asked Zhou Enlai this question. Was the French Revolution, which for all of you who don't know, occurred in 1789, was the French Revolution a success? And around 1954, which is almost 300 years afterwards, he said, it's too early to tell. That's my answer. Is the uh, Trump administration a success? Was the George W. Bush administration a success? Obama, Kennedy? I, I would go with Joe and Lai. It's too early to tell. Anyhow, it's been a great privilege to spend this evening with you. Um, I'm glad you came. Uh, you honor me by being here. And I hope I've uh, shared a few thoughts. And I'll hang around here to talk to you afterwards. And then I'll go home and have dinner with my wife. Actually, I've already had a lovely dinner. She, she teaches tonight, and she gets home late, so I'll make her a dinner. Anyhow, thank you very, very much for coming. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.